I consider it a great honor to have uh, Dr. Professor Morris Berman come to the telephone to talk with us. Uh, he has uh, done so a couple of times in the past. Please consult the whatnowsolutions.org website for the archive and see if you can dig up uh, previous Morris Berman uh, quote interviews. I think they're very rich and uh, and very meaningful as always. It is an honor to be to have you with us. I think well, the work. I, I that appreciate the third invitation, Ken. It's very yeah, kind of you. yeah, good. Uh, let me read from a recent uh, memoir that you published called "Spinning Straw into Gold," subtitled "Straight Talk for Troubled Times." This is a, a quick little bio. I'm going to do a little editing as I go. Morris Berman is a poet novelist, essayist, social critic, and cultural historian. I think I would list those things backwards. Uh, he's written 11 books, more than 100 articles, taught at universities in Europe and North America, which includes Mexico. He won, uh, he won some awards and, tellingly, was the first recipient of the annual Rollo May Center Grant for Humanistic Studies back in the day. Um, the Twilight of American Culture, the first of his second trilogy, was named a notable book by the New York Times, and he received the Neil Postman Award for a Career Achievement in Public Intellectual Activity from the Media Ecology Association. And Dr. Berman does indeed live in Mexico. Uh, can I tell you quickly my Neil Postman story? Please do. Uh, he was my faculty advisor at NYU. Uh, I, I, had the, I had the idea that maybe I'd go back after a few years uh, of taking uh, psychedelic drugs, that I'd go back and maybe get a master's degree. So I signed up at, at NYU, and I got Neil Postman uh, as a faculty advisor. And uh, frankly, I didn't take to the, uh, to, the, uh, to the life of the student. I never have very much. Although I have in my later years, I've become a wonderful student, but back when I was a kid, uh, it was no go. But I was having some trouble, and I met with Dr. Postman, uh, who I don't know his reputation these days, but uh, we considered Dr. Postman a major dude. And uh, halfway through the conversation, he, he rose up from behind his desk, and he leaned all the way over his desk until his face was just a few inches in front of mine. And he said to me very slowly, he said, Ken, what you don't realize is that this is a business. And what he meant was that uh, I was taking this education business uh, all too literally or all too seriously, and that uh, th everyone had a job to do, including uh, developing a syllabi or whatever it's called and uh, administering it. Anyway, maybe not such a great story. I don't know. But I did uh, know uh, Neil Postman, and I, was, uh, I read a lot of his work. Okay, shut up, Ken. Uh, Professor Berman, I want to get this, I want to not God help me not forget this, but you have been, you have, uh, been uh, doing some work or you have, you have a book forthcoming or it's in print now uh, yeah, concerning... Yeah, it, it should be out in a month or two. It's called Neurotic Beauty, An Outsider Looks at Japan, and um, it's just that. It's a, it's a cultural analysis of Japan and uh, should be out in uh, February, uh, latest by March, and um, I'm very excited about it. I mean, it's probably one of my best books. Well, good. Then it's, uh, it's certainly worth reading. I find your work always worth reading. Uh, this is a short memoir, Spinning Straw into Gold. Uh, I loved it, and uh, we're gonna, I'm going to uh, refer to it several times in the next, uh, in the, in the next uh, period of time. I just want to be clear to our listeners that uh, Dr. Berman, uh, many years ago, wrote uh, three books on human consciousness, and more uh, recently, although it's all fading into the past, isn't it, uh, a, a major trilogy on the American empire. He wrote The Twilight of American Culture. He wrote a book called Dark Ages America, The Final Phase of Empire. And uh, he wrote a book called Why America Failed. Not failing, not why is America failing, why America failed, the roots of imperial decline. And one of the points I want to make to all of this is that 
uh, all these books, all, all of uh, Dr. Berman's work is uh, significantly has been ahead of the curve. And for, and, and for that, many of us are very grateful. When you were on previously, uh, I got a lot of response from people thanking me for uh, bringing you to the telephone that you, you have meant and you mean a lot to a lot of people. So, Well, thank you. That's good to know. Yeah. Okay. Um, what is sitting uh, prominently uh, on the front burner of your mind or in your heart these days? Um, <laughs> it's mostly mechanical work. I'm trying to. Um, I'm <laughs> excuse me, Ken. I'm trying to get the Spanish edition of Spinning Straw into Gold into print. Uh, that should be out in a month or two. But um, <laughs> we've had some slow ups with the illustrations. But that will. Uh, appear in Mexico City soon, and I've been, you know, working on proof copies of the Japan book, and uh, so th those are the things that have been uh, taking up my time. I also run a blog for listeners who are interested, uh, just it's, um, you know, morsperman.com, and uh, we have a fun time there. It's, uh, you know, it's sort of like chronicling the collapse of the United States, <laughs> so we, uh, we, uh, sort of do a lot of winking, you know, and have, have a fun time with that. Mm -hmm. And um, and then I've been, you know, I've been thinking about future work, and I'm not really sure uh, what direction uh, that will go in. I've been interested in uh, the history of surrealist art for some time, so I've been doing some looking into that, Andre Breton and um, the, the great artists of that uh, period. And... Um, what attracts me in the surrealist movement is the issue of aliveness, that um, they were out to break stale forms and move into areas of uh, aliveness in the world. And um, in some ways it parallels the discussion that I have in Spinning Straw into Gold, where I talk about authenticity and what it means to live an authentic life, which is your own, as opposed to one that's programmed for you by the you know American culture, which is a great way to basically be part of the walking dead. And so the theme of aliveness comes up uh, over and over again. Mm -hmm. uh, you, do you reckon that aliveness is always a possibility? Yeah, I mean, you know, people think of me as pessimistic, and I'm certainly pessimistic about the United States. I think it's basically going nowhere fast and has no real future. But that doesn't mean, uh, this is shocking to Americans, that doesn't mean that the human race doesn't have a future. Because, uh, you know, we're only about 4 4.5% of the global population. And um, we will fade into insignificance within the next 30 to 40 years. And uh, the human spirit will go on. I have, of that, I have no doubt. Mm. Uh, I'd like to read something from an early book of yours, uh, this is a book that uh, electrified many people when it came out. It came out in uh, 1981. It's called Reenchantment of the World. And uh, in the introduction, uh, you write, Western life seems to be drifting toward increasing entropy, economic and technological chaos, ecological disaster, and ultimately psychic dismemberment and disintegration. And uh, what I find... Uh, uh, particularly striking about it is that this was written uh, some 33 years ago. Uh, so um, mid, I think mid 70s actually. <laughs> mid 70s. Well, yes. Was when uh, I was working on it. Yeah. Yeah, you would know. Uh, well, uh, I think all. I think it's. Uh, I think it'd be hard to argue that all these things haven't come to pass, and that we're uh, in the stage or uh, in the early stages, or maybe a little bit past. Uh, of uh, psychic dismemberment and disintegration. Uh, it feels to me and to some people, many people perhaps, uh, that, th that the wheels are coming off uh, pretty rapidly now and that uh, there really are no brakes. I think, th I think that's pretty true. I mean, you know, there's not a day, Ken, that I don't go online and read of another shooting taking place, you know, um, since... 2001, in that 10-year period, 2001 to 2011, the police across the country shot 5,000, something like 5,000 unarmed civilians, including teenagers and uh, people who were mentally ill. Uh, and 
the militarization of the police and the continual the lack of a foreign policy and continual being continually being bogged down in events over which we have no control uh, we are now number two economically in the world that just happened recently and there's not a day that I don't you know go online and see uh, just more insanity and stupidity as you know it accelerates I think we're in an accelerating phase of that and the crunch is 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 coming uh, there's no question in my mind about it i i just predicted it a bit early in the late 70s yeah. <laughs> but, but it's, it's definitely upon us now yeah uh professor berman if it's okay with you uh, i've made some notes uh, preparing to speak to you today and i'd like to just start to uh, throw out to you uh a few words here and there that I've taken from your writings. Uh, before I do that, that's, this is with your uh, agreement, of course. Uh, uh, before I do that, I'd like to invite you uh, one more time to uh, speak about anything you might like to. No, that's, that's fine, Ken. I'm, you know, I, I always enjoy talking with you, and uh, whatever is on your mind is fine with me. Okay, good. Uh, I'm intrigued by almost everything that I've... Uh, that I pull out of your literature. Uh, let's begin here. Uh, you speak about novelty uh, and creativity, uh, that these are not uh, synonymous, hardly. And you talk about uh, the, the character of American life as, uh, to a, an alarming degree, a hustle. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Um, the business about... Um, well, the, the the theme of American life being defined by hustling from really the late 16th century was uh, the theme of um, the third book in the America trilogy, Why America Failed. And it failed because uh, it ignored or marginalized all of those folks along the way who kept saying that hustling is not a way of life. It's a lack of a way of life. Uh, so we have Emerson and Thoreau and um, Lewis Mumford, John Kenneth Galbraith, going back to the Puritan divines in the, 16th, you know, in the 17th century and uh, more recently Jimmy Carter. And all those people were just pushed aside or regarded as quaint and, and silly and um, precious in a certain way, you know, that they, they weren't in touch with reality. And the question I raise is who, reality by whose definition? Because the wheels that are coming off that you spoke about recently are because the United States does not have and never had a central spiritual purpose. Um, it was always about money. Democracy was a cover for that. Uh, when Thomas Jefferson said pursuit of happiness, that was code word in the 18th century for pursuit of property. And in fact, he died with 150 slaves in tow. And uh, in his will, he just left. The, he didn't free the slaves. He just left them to you know his progeny. Um, all of the founding fathers died wealthy. I mean, they understood what they were up to, and they understood what the United States was was about. Uh, one can say that they had a larger vision than the masses, but still, in all, uh, it was um, it was it was a. I mean, I think they lamented the fact. Uh, John Adams lamented the fact that we lost a monarchy, for example, because there was a, a central, uh, cohesive sort of principle, and we, we never had one. And so the amazing thing about the United States is that America lasted for 400 years. How it did it is not clear to me. Uh, but now, now the gloves are off, and it's going nowhere fast. And that's the hustling part of it. The part about innovation and creativity I think is important because... Um, we don't realize how boring newness can be. There's always this feeling mm. that if something is turning over and you're inventing something, or you know, but if you look at these new ideas, they're just recycling uh, old things. You know, the typical uh, scenario in a corporation is uh, the the honchos get together and say we need a new product. Okay, let's call the head of production. So he comes in. And he says, uh, sure, uh, let's devise a wizard for. This is 
uh, from an article by John Rappaport, who's an American reporter. He says, let's, div- let's invent a Wizard 4. And it turns out Wizard 4 is just Wizard 3 with more bells and whistles. And so then they do it, and they market it, and it's a v- very exciting. It's like Windows 95, Windows 8, or whatever they're lately doing. It's just the same old crap. And everybody gets excited, and really it amounts to nothing. There, there's no real imagination uh, in that whole thing. And so finally, newness gets old. It's really boring because the stuff that's really innovative gets pushed aside. Uh, con- culture doesn't want to hear that. It just wants to repeat old formulas, but dressed up in a new kind of language. So there isn't much creativity going on in the United States. From that point of view, as from other points of view, it's a pretty sad place. Yeah. Well, uh, marketing is uh, is the name of the game, and uh, 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 triggering the the adrenaline uh, dynamic in the body, and uh, titillating uh, the imagination or the senses uh, will uh, produce um, interest. Yeah, uh, and and for lots of Americans, it does. You know, so we'll be discussing Kim Kardashian's rear end for weeks, as if that's what we ought to be doing. You know, I'm, I don't know if I should be, I think I should be proud to admit this uh, rather than ashamed, but I don't know if I can pick this woman out of a lineup. I, I, <laughs> I don't know. I've heard the name uh, hundreds or thousands of times. Evidently, she's, a, she's a, a big in the culture. Uh, well, she's, she's famous. She's one of these people that are famous for being famous. Yeah, and she she was interviewed, I think, by uh, Diane Sawyer. I think at one point who said, but, <laughs> but, "But what do you do? Yeah. What do you yeah. actually do? Yeah. You know?" Yeah. Well. And 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 the answer is nothing at all. It's just that the yeah. culture is so shallow that if somebody is known to be famous, doesn't matter for what, uh, if they're known to be, everybody gets excited, and uh, Americans are really mm-hmm. no different than Kim. I mean, she doesn't have. Two thoughts to rub together. Yeah. You know, what's between your ears is like a wind tunnel. But that applies to most Americans. They're not thinking either. Yeah. Well, we're thinking about the playoffs, I'll tell you that much. <laughs> uh, you write about desire. You talk about desire. Would you talk about desire for us, please? Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a, I think I, if I remember correctly, um, I connected with Marcel Proust and Jacques Lacan, uh, who basically saw desire as something that came out of an absence or a lack. And so it it follows a moving target. And the importance of that, I mean, there's an importance of that in individual life, in that we always have this notion that, um, again, it's about newness. I'll get a promotion, I'll get a new girlfriend or boyfriend, I'll something like that will occur, and then my life will be fine. And uh, in the event, you know, that old Buddha is saying about be careful what you wish for, and that we get it, um, you know, after about two or three weeks, it seems stale, and we're looking for the next job or the next girlfriend. Um, And so the the thing that both Proust and Lacan were on to was that it's about the not having that creates the, the magnetic The having doesn't create any pull whatsoever because you have it. So it's the not having that creates the pull. Now, the way that fits into the hustling and phony innovative culture uh, is that we're always, uh, the economy runs on telling you that the next thing around the corner will make your life sublime. So if you have, you know, some sort of app for your cell phone, Oh, but but you don't have App Plus when App Plus comes along. So then they market that, and everybody runs out and gets the App Plus. Um, look at the you know the stampeding that goes on at Walmart sales, where people actually kill each other, and then don't let the medics come through. You know the emergency <laughs> medical thing comes, you know, because they're going to get a DVD player for twenty nine dollars. This is what. Our desire has come down to now. This is the, the enormous power of desire fed through the capitalist system, and it's what keeps it going. Um, 
there are these movements that say, you know, don't shop on Black Thursday, uh, Black Friday, don't, you know, day after Thanksgiving, no consumer consumption whatsoever, no buying of any products whatsoever. It never works because it's, it's all an addiction, which is what desire is about. Mm. It's all a very powerful addiction. I'll get more objects, I'll get more goods. And that's what keeps the system going. If people just stopped buying all this junk that they don't need, the economy would collapse overnight. If pigs could fly, you know, it 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 it, it makes one uh, think about the American people, whether the American people have been uh, massively uh, uh, victimized or made uh, made an experiment of uh, by the marketing uh, geniuses of America, or whether the American people have essentially begged for this sort of culture, whether there's something uh, uh, not particularly. Uh, uh, matured about the American uh, 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 public. Yeah. You know, 1955, Lewis Hartz wrote a book called The Liberal Tradition of, in America, and he introduced the notion of the fragment society. And he said a fragment society is one that breaks off from the mother country, but doesn't take, only takes one fragment or one strand of that mother country's worldview and ideology and makes that into their whole worldview. And, of course, what he was referring to is that in the United States, uh, what broke off and became the dominant um, strand of American culture was the uh, English middle-class entrepreneurship, that, that whole tradition, what has been called the theory of possessive individualism. And... So we are basically, and have been from the very beginning, terribly shallow people, terribly shallow people. It's one of the things that the Founding Fathers talked about in letters to each other and their diaries and so on and so forth. And that all that matters is this hustling and getting ahead. And so that's the thing, that's the quarrel, I use that word in quotes, that I have with Noam Chomsky, whom I admire very much, but... Um, he's only partly right when he says that um, the American people have been victimized and it's a case of manufacturing consent, is his phrase. Um, it's as though, I mean, he's arguing that basically the American public has been raped uh, by advertisers and so on. And that's partly true, but it's more a case, I think, given the background I just outlined, it's more a case of consensual sex. Um, it wasn't so much rape as they got very quickly in bed with the people that were feeding them all this garbage. And that's what they want. They want Kim Kardashian, and they want toys, and they want the latest app, and that's about as deep as the American life gets. Mm -hmm. And so to say, I mean, Noam would say it's not true that people get the government that they deserve. Uh, they're essentially screwed over. But I think they do get the government they deserve. I think they get the government who they are. Um, the late George Carlin, may he rest in peace, wonderful comedian, uh, once remarked, where do you think our leaders come from, Mars? <laughs> you know, I mean, a rotten culture produces rotten representatives. And that's what we've got. These, these people like Obama and Hillary, they're not accidents. They are reflections of the culture. Yeah, you write about the limits of our civilization. You write about authenticity. Um, I wanted to quote something again from the reenchantment of the world. It really struck me. You wrote, uh, real survival consists in living according to the dictates of your own nature, and that cannot be achieved until the risk of psychic death is confronted directly. Uh, I've, for decades, I've had my own notion of uh, concepts such as uh, psychic death. Uh, I'd love to hear yours. Well, in, I mean, in the case of, in the context of what we've just been talking about, um, it would mean that a person uh, would have to say, an American would have to say, what if I got off that whole track, the whole hustling, innovation, 
um, and self-advancement trick. What if my mind, my life were not to be about that? What would it be about? And the psychic death involved is that at that point they would draw a blank because there are very little sources. As I said, we've marginalized people like Emerson and Thoreau and so on. So that there are very little sources, few sources you can go to that can say, this, this is the good life. This is what you need. Very, very few sources that do that. The ones that say this is the good life are basically Madison Avenue. You need a, a wizard for. You need another amp. And so the psychic death that one would confront is like asking an alcoholic, stop drinking and just see what it feels like. Yeah. It's at that point that you start to go bananas. And the only way to find out what's on the other side of that watershed is being willing to risk that psychic death, which is the death of everything you knew or thought um, made your life uh, worthwhile, right. you know. And so uh, that's pretty scary. It's not going to happen en masse, it's, that's for sure. But individuals, I mean, who am I writing for? I have very, very few sales, uh, you know, who, who exactly is out there, you know. Um, but for those few who are out there, you know, they can maybe entertain the idea, hey, there's a better, you know, this guy saying to me that there's a better life uh, really? than the one I'm than the one I'm living. I just have really? to tolerate a little bit of anxiety, you know. Really? Well, there's got to be. <laughs> um, the phrase, uh, let's see here, uh, form over content. Talk about that, please. Uh, yeah, I mean, again, in the context of what we've been discussing. Um, Content would be the real stuff that makes you feel alive and that's worthwhile. And form is uh, how that's uh, presented or the, the chasing of, of appearances. Um, because, um, you know, you know I, I, I talked about this before. I, I was uh, giving some lectures at a East Coast University a couple of years ago, and uh, the Dean of Humanities had a discussion with me, and he said, you know, um, years ago I had a student, and he uh, dropped out, and um, and then 20 years later he resurfaced, and he said, at that time I was a faculty member, and I was talking about values, and he resurfaced 20 years later, and he invited me over to dinner, and he showed me all of these toys he had, you know, DVD player, and a plasma screen and all he just had one technological toy after another and uh, he showed them all to me as though he were saying uh see my life really was a success yeah. i dropped out but look look yeah. look what i and then there was a kind of lull he said and then he turned to me and he said what's important in your life and he said it with this kind of plaintive voice which would indicate that all those toys had failed him because he had pursued form instead of content. You know, I mean, that's the great Steve Jobs story. What did Steve Jobs actually do? You know, I mean, it was all design technique. It was all about form. Meanwhile, he accumulated $8.5 billion in the town <laughs> of Shenzhen, you know, in the town of Shenzhen in China, where Apple was <laughs> manufacturing all this crap. Um, Teenagers were working 14 hours a day for 14 cents an hour. And they had to put screens outside the windows so that the kids couldn't jump to their deaths, which was what was happening. This is Steve Jobs. And this is here. When he died, there were candlelight vigils. And so you see how shallow <laughs> Americans are, how empty they are, and how form is all that counts for them. You know, and... It, it brings to mind, I mean, for most Americans, this won't happen, only for a very few, but it brings to mind that story by Tolstoy called The Death of Ivan Illich, where the last three days of Illich's life, he's lying on his deathbed, and he's recounting his life, and what comes up was that he had lived for form instead of content. He had lived for appearances, and the result was that his whole life was a waste of time, except for these three days which were devoted to content. And then he died. Most Americans won't even have those three days. They'll just snuff out, never even realizing that the whole thing was a charade. 
for those of us who uh, have, for better or worse, uh, lived for form over content or lived the American uh, script f to uh, pursue happiness, uh, uh, how does one, where does one find content? Where does one go for content if one uh, has, uh, hasn't read a book uh, in 30 years or, uh, <laughs> right. or is just not in the habit of, uh, of, uh, of lying down quietly, or sitting in a chair in the dark and, and actually um, uh, thinking or contemplating? Uh, uh, where does one go for for rich content? It doesn't seem to be available on the menu. It's there, but you have to know that it exists in the first place. And most Americans don't know that. Um, in other words, they live in a world of what you see is what you get. And, and what they're getting is what's coming across screens, usually. They don't read books anymore, as you point out. And so it's it's just... Pablum. I mean, they're they're not getting uh, any indications of where to go for content, and the number of significant teachers. I mean, I had a, for example, a marvelous high school uh, English teacher uh, who was, uh, you know, I mean, what money would he be in it for? There was no money. He just was dedicated to turning uh, teenagers onto content. That was his goal in life. You right. know, so. Right. You know, the, the number of people that exist like that, you do run across them occasionally, but the yes. number of people that exist like that are getting smaller and smaller. I remember, I, I was asked a number of times uh, when I was, uh, uh, you know, a visiting sociology prophet uh, you know, at Catholic U in Washington. So uh, I was asked to address various social classes and stuff. And I, w I remember I would start off and I would say, you know, um, before you went off to school, your parents warned you uh, that the devil appears in many forms, and you've got to keep your guard up and make sure that you follow the American way and not be enticed away from that by the devil. And I said, I got news for you. He just showed up in your classroom. <laughs> And then, you know, I would talk about an alternative to living what they were doing, an alternative to the scripted life. Now, I would say that if I talked to a class of 50, maximum one to two would understand what the hell I was saying, uh, you know, and would go home, look up Emerson or Thoreau or whoever on the Internet, and say, nuts, I'm going to read these books. I'm, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to live that scripted life. One or two, 48 or 49, it would go in one ear, out the other, and it was as if I didn't even exist. But it was worth it to me to do that talk just to capture those one or two. And there are people out there that, that can do that for young people. It's just that they're starting to disappear more and more, and the literature is... I mean, you have to, you have to go and, and, and find it, and you have to even know it exists to begin with. So it's a hard job, as you point out. Yeah, you have to suffer a psychic death. You have to, uh, you have to take a leap at the moon. Yeah, you I have mean, to hitting, intuit. Hitting bottom, they call it in alcoholics and animals. Hitting you bottom. Yeah. You have to have the, the the strange sense that there's something, there's something more to all this. Um, Spinning straw into gold is the title you've given your memoir. Uh, this is from uh, Rumpelstiltskin, yes? Yeah, Grimm's Fairy Tales. And uh, are we pretty clear what, what spinning straw into gold uh, refers to or what it means? Well, the, the, I mean, in the, in the story that, um, you know, the, the, print, the woman who marries the king, Rumpelstiltskin teaches her how to, you know, on the sly, how to spin straw into gold and make the king happy, and it's literal gold. But, I, I mean... To me, there's a larger metaphorical message here, and that is that um, your our job on this earth is to spin straw into gold, not literal gold, but in the sense that um, you take the material that you have given you, you have the material, uh, and you make something 
great of your life, not in the sense of popular success or commercial success, but in the sense of becoming a rich, inwardly rich person, a spiritually rich person, and you pass that on. That's the idea of spinning straw into gold. The idea of American culture is spinning gold into straw. That is to say, uh, you may have the gold within you. You were born with certain abilities and tendencies and so on. And what they want you to do is turn your life into caca, which most people do. So I was just trying to, it's a drop in an ocean, obviously. Um, but I was just trying to say, you know, you can live a life that's inwardly rich. You can live an authentic life. You're going to have to work at it. But what we are here on this earth to do is to spin straw into gold, and gold in the sense of what enriches the culture in a moral sense, in a spiritual sense, intellectually, right. and right. so on. Right. Uh, last several years, number of years, I've been doing an experiment with money. I've been essentially... Uh, seeing how I could do without any. <laughs> and uh, it's not easy, but uh, but there's a lot of gold that comes out of the experiment. And uh, I'm certainly glad I've undertaken this way. Um, it's been two and a half years since this memoir. Uh, I'm, I'm interested. It's been a hell of a two and a half years for all of us. I'm interested in uh, in where you're where you're at, uh, in what you what you think and feel uh, since the memoir, in terms of uh, like you say, passing along uh, the real gold of life uh, uh, to others. Well, you know, it's kind of funny because people are shocked that I'm actually quite a happy person. Why would I be? You know, uh, as I said, my stuff doesn't sell. Uh, nobody reads it. If I send articles into journals, I don't even. They don't even bother sending me a rejection letter. <laughs> you know, and so uh, you know. And meanwhile, the culture is going to hell in a basket. Uh, so how come I'm not depressed? And it's kind of interesting because when I hear um, so-called progressives, you know, talk about uh, you know how we're going to reverse this or that, or we're going to foment a revolution and so on and so forth. Uh, I sense a kind of sadness uh, in their expression, their faces, the, the tone of voice, and so on, because on some level they know that's all poop. And the reason I'm happy is not because the United States is in great shape or something like that, but because I believe, to the best of my ability, that I'm in touch with the truth. Even if the truth is horrible, it's the truth. And that's my definition of success. Success for me is living in reality. Um, the reason these progressives, as well as the rest of the country, are not very happy is they're living in fantasy. And on some, you know, some level, that fantasy is not delivering the goods. And so they're pretty miserable, basically. But um, it's, you know, in the, in the one that I write this, I wrote this in the summer of uh, 2012. Um, and uh, uh, I'm just looking at the, yeah, Mexico City, July 13th, 2012. So, so I wrote it a little more than, you know, maybe two and a half years ago, as you said. And in that uh, time, uh, I, I mean, I, I just watch all the stuff that I've predicted coming, coming to pass, mm -hmm. and it's not very good stuff. But at least I was not um, kidding myself. You know, and that's, and frankly, the feedback that I'll get, whether it's on the blog or people write me letters about books that I've written and so on, is, is say, at least if we consult you, it's not upbeat, but at least it's real. We know we're getting the real poop here. We're not, we're not getting some fairy tale about where the United, how great the United States is and where it's going to be. And there's a great relief in that for them and for me as well, because... You know, I don't think there's any, to me, higher definition of success than simply living in reality. And that's what I try to do. You know, there can't be any sugarcoating of it. And I'm not going to write one of these books that, and there are plenty of them, 
that go on for 500 pages, 490 pages as to what a disaster the U.S. is. And then the last 10 pages pulls a <laughs> rabbit out of the hat and says, oh, we're going to reverse all this. And I, what, did you have a lobotomy? <laughs> what is wrong with you? <laughs> you know? Tell us about chance and fate and, and a vector. What's a vector? Chance well, and fate. Yeah, I mean, that, that whole thing was, oh, that whole part of the book, Spinning Strong to Gold, is about finding an authentic path for yourself, because that's the path of aliveness, or the path of truth, for, you know, for you, for authenticity. And that um, I have the, the sensation, I mean, there's always this conflict between randomness and what's fated for you, but, you know, if you follow the sense of what you really feel, not what the culture is telling you, but on the deepest level, if you follow the sense of who you are and what's right for you, um, what you take as chance, that is this, the, you take a leap of faith, as you said earlier, and step into what's right for you, that will become your fate. So in that sense, uh, there's not really, you know, a conflict between them. But, um, you know, all of this... Re- requires uh, a seeing through the baloney of the culture and then, um, you know, the courage to say, that's the psychic death, the courage to say, that's not for me, that's not my path. I'll tell you the truth, uh, Professor Berman. When you were on uh, the radio with me uh, a couple of years ago, two, three, four years ago, uh, I got letters from people and it was there was there was a real um, feeling in in their communications. They really there was a sense of oh, it's so good to hear Morris Berman. Oh, Morris Berman really uh, stepped into my life at a moment and made a big difference. Oh, it was so uh, relieving and uh, and and practically electrifying to have to just have have uh, someone speak truthfully or to speak uh, about what was clearly uh, a visible uh, or partially visible to all of us and that no one ever said a word about uh, the twilight of American culture. My gosh, that was a radical notion uh, 15, 20, 30 years ago, whenever, uh, whenever the book was written. I think it was 15 years ago. 2000, so, yeah. So... Really, uh, you know, I'm, I, 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 when I, I'm, I relocated here to the East Coast, uh, I'm in Amherst, Massachusetts, and uh, I thought of you. Uh, I'm not on the radio anymore. This is uh, what they call a podcast. Uh, I barely know what that is myself, but uh, I, I thought of you more as like a visitation than as any sort of you know, uh, probing interview in your to your latest work. I just wanted to have you come to the telephone again, thinking of my listeners and myself, and just uh, visit with you and check in with you and and uh, and hear you speak to us. Well, it's uh, very kind of you to hear me, Ken. I mean, I really appreciate everything you've said. Uh, yeah, it means a lot. Yeah. Is there anything else you know that you'd like to tell? You like to say to our listeners, or or to me, or anybody, or the air. Um, <laughs> the air. <laughs> you know, I. We 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 wish the best for each other, and and a lot of that now in this advanced stage of, of uh, of uh, disintegration, of uh, of an era, uh, lawful disintegration of an era. Uh, much of what we wish for each other is some peace of mind and some uh, simple pleasures and some understanding and and uh, the richness of uh, of uh, of reading reading uh, you know uh, stimulating uh, men and women or you know what I'm saying uh, well all of that's attainable I mean that's the individual has to make up their mind that they're going to switch out of uh, you know the mass entertainment that Neil Postman ridiculed and criticized and that they're going to live a real life. But it's an existential decision, and, I mean, either you'll take it or you won't, you know. Right, right. Well, 
you know, uh, I really don't have much else to uh, to ask of you. Uh, no, uh, how about a year from now? We'll do another one of these. I'll talk about the Japan book, and we'll have a good time. I'd love that. Thank you, and uh, Happy New Year. It's, it's going to be a hell of a year for all of us uh, right. to witness, if nothing else. So, uh, you know, many blessings. Okay, Ken. Thanks again. We'll talk. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye now.